Hello, everyone. My goodness. Welcome. What a night. The weather was gorgeous today. We're all gathered here again to celebrate our students and their work. I have more to share on that in just a second. My, I'm Michael Kleber Diggs. Hi, it's so nice to be with you all again this year. My job is just to kind of set the table, like just explain how the evening is going to work. Um, we have a lot of really wonderful work, so I'm just going to get right to it. Um, first, welcome. Hi. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here. It means a lot to us, and it means a lot to our students. Second, this is a casual reading. The whole house is welcome. Your dogs are welcome. Your cats are welcome. Your chinchilla, your tarantula, everyone's welcome. And this is a celebration. We're going to keep it really casual and joyful. And uh, if, like, I don't know, if your kids roll through, let them roll through. We'll just wave and say hi. We are going to have everyone on mute until at certain points in the program, we'll take you off mute. And we'll let you know when those are. And you might have to click the button um, on your Zoom window. Just, uh, But we hope during that time that everyone will be able to make some joyful noise for our students and for MPWW. All right. We are celebrating the 10th birthday of the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop tonight. And wow, 10 years of doing this important work and being supported by our community. And we'll share more about that as the night goes on. Tonight's program is a retrospective. It includes um, pieces that you may have heard at past readings and videos that you may have seen before. It's kind of consistent with a book that we've uh, put out recently that's just an opportunity to share work that we've loved over the years and that our readers and community has loved over the years. So uh, we hope that you enjoy tonight's program. As always, this is the most important part of the night. Feedback means everything. We'll try like crazy to create enough time in between readings for you to enter a note in the chat. And when you do that, we'll make sure that our students see it. We'll send them all the comments that you share. If you want to highlight a line in a work that you love, you can do that. Um, if you just want to share your general reaction to a piece, you can do that. We'll do everything we can to make sure that you have enough time to do that and keep the program moving at the same time. I also want to point out for access that live captioning is available. At the top of your screen, you should see a live transcription option. And if you want to activate that down at the bottom, you'll see live transcript and a CC button, closed captioning. Click on that, and then you'll see text uh, for what's being said tonight. I want to make sure that you know that option is available. Now, the feedback link for our students will be live for three days. So if you can't enter comments tonight, and you'll see the link for that, you can go back in later and share feedback and reactions. Um, that's really kind of one of the most important things that we do as part of this reading. And uh, we also want to thank uh, the Minnesota State Arts Board. Like so many organizations in the state, we benefit from the generous support of the voters in Minnesota. And I wanna read um, what they ask organizations to read uh, tied to that support. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through grants from the Minnesota State Arts Board and the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Um, it takes the whole state and the state is supporting arts and culture and we're grateful like every organization for that support. We're gonna have a quick birthday celebration in a few minutes. We'll turn our mics on. Um, if you have a cake and a candle, we'll, do, we'll have an opportunity to kind of blow out the candles as part of that birthday celebration. And then at the end of the program, there'll be an opportunity to say goodbye to students and hello to students. And if you have a sign, you can hold that up. Um, I just made mine. All I had was a black pen. But hey, 
it's the message. Let's let's focus on the message. Um, a chance to say to hello and send a positive greeting and say goodbye uh, to our students at the end of the program. Following our 10th anniversary event, um, you'll receive an email with a link to a survey that's connected to a research project being conducted by Anne Deben Thornton. The survey is at the begin it's the beginning of a data collection for a research project that examines the impact of reading and hearing narratives and other forms of creative expression on community perception of writers and artists who are incarcerated in the state of Minnesota. The survey will take less than 10 minutes of your time, and we encourage you to participate. This research is supported by the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. So just to, to reiterate, you'll receive a link to a survey. That survey is a research project that concerns creative expression for incarcerated persons. Um, if you have time and inclination, we hope that you'll take a moment to respond to that survey. Finally, tonight's event will be recorded and sent to all of the facilities for our students, as well as uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, wanted to make sure that you are aware of that. Thanks so much for being here. It means a lot to have you here with us. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our founder and our artistic director, Jen Bowen. Jen? Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's been a while since we've had a reading on Halloween and you all look amazing. Um, Michael, thank you again, as always, for emceeing so that we don't have to do it ourselves. And also for being, <laughs> Mike's excited, for being such a thoughtful and invested instructor and board president. Um, you've always been a treasure to us. And um, tonight it's fun to see you in this space, our space, when the rest of the galaxy knows that you're a treasure too. So yay for us. Um, on behalf of our students, I first wanna welcome friends and family of MPWW writers who are in the audience tonight. Um, we already heard from Ms. Chan and, and many of you who are joining us to support your people from Detroit, from the Philippines, from China and everywhere in between. And we're so moved and glad that you're here. Um, and thanks to each and every one of you who have been in this audience for years. Some of you are really familiar faces and names, and I know you've been with us for ages. Um, you've listened to and seen our students through their words. Um, we wouldn't have gotten a start also um, without the support of the education staff of the Minnesota Department of Corrections. And many, many, many of those staff members are on this Zoom tonight, some who are no longer with the DOC and others who still are. Um, but please know that they make education on the inside possible, and we couldn't do this work without them. Um, thank you also to our tremendous board of directors. Michael, um, by the way, did I say that? Michael is our board president and has been forever, and we've actually put a, a bylaw in that he's not able to quit. So that's fun and funny. Um, he's stuck with us forever. Um, if you check your program, Mike will put that in the chat. You'll be able to see the names of the board members and the education staff who are super helpful to us. Um, I also really want to thank MPWW's mentors. Given the year, we have somewhere between 30 and 80 mentors working with mentees on the inside, and they are invaluable to our students. Um, when the facilities are locked down, they're still reading and responding to packets on the outside. Sometimes that's the only hint of community that makes it inside even if that connection does happen via a PDF. And later you'll hear from Ari Tyson, who is our new mentor coordinator and a rock star in her own right. And we're really grateful to her too. Um, our instructors, you're gonna see a few of them tonight, but not, by no stretch will you see all of them. Um, many of them have been around for five, seven, 10 years. Um, they are among the most devoted artists and educators I've ever known. Um, they understood when they agreed to this long-term commitment that this was going to be a long haul and not a short stint, and they have not wavered. Um, to each and every one of you, you honor our students with the miles you put on your car and the years you've devoted, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. I know our students are too. Um, we'd be really, really boring, you guys, without Sue Wong. Um, she's our social media coordinator, coordinator and also the sort of glittering star and guiding force um, behind the reading and so many other things that we do. We're lucky to have her help lead our community. Um, Mike Alberti, if you've been to this reading before, you know that I think he's one of the actual literal best humans I've ever met. And also coincidentally, 
the best managing director and both of those things for the same reasons among them Mike's kindness his intelligence and his ability to learn any stinking thing which has manifest unfortunately for him in the last two years into downloading DVDs to send into facilities because of COVID. So see, he can go back in time, he can go forward in time. He's really amazing. Um, I know, hands up, Mike, take a bow. Um, it is no exaggeration to say that MPWW might not exist and certainly wouldn't thrive without Mike. Um, when he joined us as a director, we got really, really lucky. Um, and last, of course, but never ever least, our MPWW's current and former students. Um, those of you in the audience have seen our students' hard work revealed through their glorious writing for years, oftentimes. Um, but what may be less obvious to all of you from this reading and many others is that the work they do every single day to build and sustain this community is what leaves us here today. Um, they've done this work from day one and long before we came in with books and with notepads. And we're able to share their words year after year because when they're not writing, they're recruiting writers in their units and they're sharing books with each other and they're teaching each other and they're envisioning new programming and they're working hard despite whatever opportunities they're given. And please know that they've been doing that long before any programs came in. And if programs all went away, they would do the same. Um, they're the reason we're here and the reason we're celebrating 10 years as a community. And I just wanna say to our students on behalf of all of the instructors and all of the mentors and all of the people in this audience, we love your art and we love this community that we've built together. So thank you for trusting us and for sharing your life and your words with us. And now I'm sorry to let you all know that Louise had something come up. She was gonna give our introduction, our former student slash rock star, beautiful poet, wonderful human. Um, she can't be here tonight, but um, we're super delighted that in place of Louise tonight, Matt Rasmussen, a wonderful instructor of ours, is going to read the very first introduction ever presented at our very first reading. It was written by one of MPWW's very first students, Paul, who made the work so much fun. We worked um, as if we had no choice. We were com just compelled to build something sturdy so we could always come back. Um, Paul is in the audience tonight. His intro is our favorite, among our favorites, I should say, and Matt's going to share that with us tonight. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jen. I think we should all give a round of applause to Jen. Uh, oh, I don't know, for everything, I guess. Um, all right, I'm going to put this over the front of my screen so I cannot see any of you, so I don't panic. <laughs> Um, so this is titled 10,000 Hearts, Paul, and I'm even more nervous now knowing that Paul is not, but I will do my best, Paul. <laughs> 10,000 Hearts. I became involved with the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop in November 2011, back when it was just called Jen's Class. Class was always the highlight of my week, not just because it broke up the monotony of doing time but because every Friday from one to four, we weren't felons or inmates or convicts or offenders. We were students and critics and essayists and so-so poets and storytellers. This class offered us something rarely found inside the razor wire, dignity. We had opinions which were valued, a craft to sharpen and voices worth listening to. At the end of the class, we read our work for an audience of teachers, therapists, corrections officers, and even the warden. We all left class better people than we came in and knew we had done something we could be proud of. <clears throat> Excuse me. Prison life conditions us to expect that whenever something good happens, it is an anomaly which will be corrected before it repeats itself. So I thought writing class would be a one-time thing. If it were, it would have been the highlight of my five-year sentence. But things only got better from there. MPWW was back and wanted a former student to serve as a teaching assistant. The other five graduates of our first class had already been released, so I became the best man for the job. I'd already learned the basics the first year, so work with my writing class became less about how to keep my prose in the correct tense or what the heck a semicolon was, or mo and more about how to create a piece of literature that affects anyone who reads it. 
that was when I realized writing wasn't just something I had a knack for. It was my gift, and I wanted to share it with the world. I was asked to pilot a correspondence program where MFA students and graduates would mentor incarcerated writers. That was when I began learning from my mentor, Annika. We both agreed to a minimum of three correspondences and would decide if we would wanted to continue from there. 21 months later, we were on our 15th round of correspondence with hundreds of pages of finished work. And I'm still learning more from her with each passing packet. In that time, I've taken a third class, read my work for a crowd of more than 200 inmates, made the warden cry, have been published in two international literary journals, and had the honor of having my work read for more than 120 guests at Hamlin University in February. Beyond the measurable successes, writing has helped me make sense of life marked by senseless trauma and painful memories. When I came to prison, I brought the baggage of combat, combat PTSD from Iraq and the scars of coming from a family riddled with suicides. On countless nights in the confines of a dark cell, my therapists were the white space on my paper and a 30 cent black big pen. Through writing, I was able to face the horrors of my past, find bits of beauty among the ugliness, honor my losses and move forward. Every person I've met in prison, whether through treatment, religion, education, or work programs, they all want something better. Thanks to the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop, I found more than I could have dreamed. Tonight, you will hear stories and poems written by a handful of men and women in prisons throughout Minnesota. Like me, they're deemed a danger to society men who threw away everything for the needle, the pipe, or the bottle. There are women who haven't seen the stars in years. People who have forgotten what good food tastes like, or the pleasures that come with rolling the car windows down and letting the wind blow in their faces. Moms who have watched their children grow up in visiting rooms. These stories are written by men who know what it is to be locked in a steel box with nothing but a mirror they can't bring themselves to look into. Some of you know these folks. You already know they're more than what is said about them in court papers and police reports. You know their hopes and dreams, their pet peeves, what they sound like when they laugh. Some of you even remember holding them as babies. Some of you in the audience, <clears throat> excuse me, may have been in the same situation as these men at some point. You can rattle off your six digit offender ID number by heart. Others here have never seen the inside of a prison or met the men behind these stories, but your very presence here tonight is a testimony that despite our mistakes, there are still people willing to give us a chance. And some of you are just amazing therapists who have come to cheer for your most high maintenance client. Whatever brings you here on behalf of all incarcerated writers, thank you so much for your support. The night my stories were read at Hamlin, I sat alone in my cell and read them out loud. I knew that somewhere out there in the world beyond the fence, my words were touching people's hearts. When I called my family that night to hear all about it and received the audience comments cards a couple weeks later, I felt the warmth of the outside world reaching back. To most people, prisons don't even exist. They are places where criminals are sent and forgotten about until they have paid their debt to society. But as my words are read to you, close your eyes and picture 10,000 hearts beating in cages. Oh man, these stories and poems are a glimpse into just a few of those hearts. That's it. Thank you so much. 
I'm supposed to hold it together. I'm the MC tonight. I just uh, was deeply moved by that. What they sound like when they laugh. I don't know. I'm thinking back to that line, how to create a piece of literature that affects everyone who reads it. Um, and seeing that goal accomplished in that work and in the work of so many our, of our students. Thank you for that beautiful reading, Matt and Paul. Thank you for those resonant words that are as impactful today as they were the day that you wrote them. I'm very present with you and the emotion of that piece. And um, I'm very grateful to you for taking the time to do that. Um, the work that you're doing and the work that our students are doing is important. And it has the power to move uh, and impact communities. So thank you. So 10 years ago this month, MPW was an, or MPWW was an organization that, as Paul just said, uh, was one multi-genre class at Lionel Lakes Prison with six students. Jen's class. Today, we're proud to work with students at every adult facility in the state. Those same students have, over the years, built an arts community from the inside. They've collaborated in building that community and they allow us now to work in more depth with them and on a national level with organizations like the Freedom Reads Project in America, Catherine Savage and the Tulsa Arts Fellowship, Saginaw Valley State University, and other organizations and universities who help us share our students' legacy of building community through art and because of art. MPWW belongs to its students. It is sustained by this community and it benefits every day from the contribution of its staff, its instructors, its mentors, and its board. Please light a candle if you have one. Show us your baked goods if you have them. And thanks to filmmaker Ryan Stapera, we have a short video to play in celebration. Happy birthday, MPWW, and thanks again, students. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce a short one-minute film um, featuring a poem called Prison Pastoral. And thanks again to filmmaker Ryan Stapera, who made the video for us. Prison Pastoral. I once mistook a gray moss lying at my feet on faded grass for a blanched butterfly. Its casual stillness, wings curved, hieroglyphs stilly against the bronze lawn, startled me. Everything in prison moves with hunched caution. Flightless, but bent on flying. Did it know this wasn't pasture meant to land on? Did it know my pale shadow wasn't an L. And never could be. Did it not know, no matter how much, pretending it was a moth. I tried to find answers woven in fine silk 
on its quiet wings. The language was dust. The language was dust. The language was dust. And some of you may uh, remember that uh, poem. Uh, it was written by one of our students, B. And it was also featured on one of our first broadsides. Uh, B is a beloved poet, and we could not have our 10 year retrospective without honoring that poem and B's work. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Torres, um, who will share a couple of poems. Hey everybody, um, special hello, shout out to uh, all the current students and former students. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Torres. Uh, I'm, an, a po I'm a poet and instructor with MPWW. And I will be reading two poems, the first one by David and the second one by Kennedy. So this first one by David is called The Retreat. We practice silence in the cell a fan does its paradoxical part, hums along in the light and in the dark. Like monks in their rough spun robes, we live most of our days alone. In our heads, speech comes at intervals, echoes off cement walls, five angled around the pebbled floor, the slab concrete ceiling, the cold metal toilet blends without seam into a geometric sink like half abstract Duchampian art. Outside a fence, no taller than a lunar lander. The world carries on, a consuming fire, but we remain still as the surface of the moon. Cold as space, gray, coated in dust, without wind or flame. So this next one is by Kennedy. It's called Wasifu Wa Marimu, the Epitaph of Death. There will be no roar of drums summoning mourners to my funeral. The great horn of the rhino will not sing my name. The women who loved me won't be there to bathe me in milk or plant the red flowers that will eat my blood. The elders won't plant the giant flame tree that will guard my spirit. The sacred black bulls won't stomp down my grave like they did for my father, his father, and the fathers before him. The great python won't sleep on my grave in homage. My name will not be carved into a spear. My heart will not lie in the belly of the warrior drum, which rumbles on its own in war times. If this is exile, I don't know what to call home. So now it's uh, my pleasure to, uh, and my honor to introduce our next reader, the new poet laureate of Minnesota, Gwen Westerman, the first native poet laureate of the state. Um, Gwen is a friend and a colleague. And I just wanna say, um, I was trying to think of my first memory uh, of knowing Gwen and the first one and every memory of Gwen is just Gwen always trying to like help someone out or help me out. She helped me out like the first time I remember interacting with her and she's just always sort of been that in every interaction. So it's, uh, I'm really excited for her appointment as poet lawyer of the state. So Gwen, it's all yours. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> and thank you everyone. I'm honored to be here and uh, I'll be reading a poem by Zeke called The Mother's Lament after William Carlos Williams, The Widow's Lament in Springtime. Sorrow is my own garden where the flowers bloom as they have bloomed often before, but not with the bitter thorns that prick and chap my hands this year. Forty years I had with my husband. 
18 years I visited my son in prison. The crab apple is white today, dressing for its bitter fruit. Silk clustering petals, heavy the lilac bushes, violet and some pink. But the grief in my heart throbs stronger than they. For though they were my pride over many springs, today I sleep amidst them, misremembering. 18 years I visited my son. Today I dreamed he was young, long haired. He was free. He whispered to me that on the other side of the coiled fence at the edge of the woods, bound by heavy chains to the injuries of time, he saw a future with white flowers, some violet and some pink, a meadow where the flowers lie like plumes of cloud in a cerulean sky. I'm sure I would like to go there and fall asleep in the pillows of those plumes. And next, it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Reeves. And uh, Kevin is going to read one of his pieces. Kevin? So, shout out to my man, Zeke. Such a powerful poem. Just to sit with that for a moment before we go on to Free Bro. He's going to be here next year, right? That's going to be great. So this poem that I will read is going to be from my collection of poetry, Luckily Fish Don't Need Raincoats. Um, this particular poem I wrote after I was home, I had a chance to do some reflecting. And all of us as writers know the poems don't care about us, right? The poems is bigger than us. They don't care about what we're thinking or nothing like that. And I sat on my couch one day and I wrote this poem. Um, it was healing and shout out back to Zeke again. It felt like the end of the chain link fence at the end of a forest somewhere. So. I'm still traveling. So the title of this poem is 18 and 32. Bear with me. You ever couldn't find your own poem? Right? All right, here we go. 18 and 32. Damn. This world has fucked up my smile, sped up my chill, redirected me. Freedom felt like sand through hands. That fucked me up too. Left me in puddles, dirty as hell, cleaning the shoes of travelers. I ain't know nothing about having a woman or being in an adult relationship and how tedious it was, the requirement of paying attention it's difficult to be a good partner when you struggle with discipline. That sprouted. My son has been a joy, but my scope on fatherhood was being to my son what I wish my father could have been to me. It worked for a while until I realized what I wanted from my father was from the perspective of someone who didn't have his father to teach him discipline. That sprouted too. All my vices, the mindless shit I do. That sprouted. It left me with too many people I'm responsible for. The time I was 19, sitting in a cell, wishing I can go to school, the HBCU, the parties I missed on campus, the sister who have would have taught me to open up doors, the chance to pledge a fraternity and learn some discipline. That sprouted too. Born last, the run of my pack. Now I'm leading the pride. That blessed my heart, the requirement of stewardship over my, over my manifest itself sprouted too. He kept me busy, skipping discipline, not being here to say goodbye to my grandma, 
and all the legends who raised me. That sprouted too, but that left me with pride. I visited them in the ocean. The cause and effect of merely existing, meaning that you will be exposed to trauma, that sprouted too. It left me confused, healing on my couch, thinking, damn, I did fly over the ocean. Thank you, thank you all. Um, next, I wanna introduce the next reader and writer, Ashley M. Jones. Thank you, Kevin. That poem, I'm still in your poem. So I'm gonna try to read this poem, even though I'm still in yours. Shout um, out to the MPWW, 10 years, amazing. Jen's class. I didn't know that that was the origin. Shout out to the MPWW, congratulations to the home team. 100 more years of success, but not in prisons. We're going to change the name to something else, writing workshop, but we'll be writing in 100 years. All right. Well, uh, hopefully, can y'all hear me? Yes? OK, great. Um, so my name is Ashley, as Kevin said. And again, thank you, Kevin, for your poem. And thanks, everybody who's read. And thank you to all of the students for being so um, amazing and vulnerable. It does take vulnerability to write, as we all know. Um, I am just stunned by what I have heard, and I'm so inspired um, to see what's going on in my state and try to make it do what this is doing. Um, so like I said, my name is Ashley. I am the incoming poet laureate of the state of Alabama, and I'm the first Black person, the first person of color to hold this position. Um, and I'm also the youngest, and um, that's a huge honor, but I'm really honored to be here um, that y'all would allow me to read one of these pieces. My latest book is called Reparations Now, and I think an important part of the reparations discussion has to be a discussion of the carceral system um, and the horrors that it um, inflicts on us, because little do we know, even if we're not inside, this is still impacting us. Um, so I'm going to read a poem by Jamie from the anthology, Drop a Kite. If you don't have a copy, please get a copy. It's called Where I'm From. I am from a broken tree of pimps, drug dealers, and women of the night. I'm from the tear-stained face of Barbara Jean Porter, whose screams pierced through the late nights from years of domestic violence. I am from the background of, you better be home by the time the street lights come on and don't leave the porch once they do. I'm from the days gone by of catching fireflies in a glass mason jar and then drinking Kool-Aid from it the next day. I am from the time of lemon pledged wood tables and furniture pine saw smelling floors and use some elbow grease. I am from the neighborhood of, it still takes a village to raise a child, speak when spoken to and take your hat off in my house. The life of hanging clothes out on the line, letting them dry extra time if they were rained on, double dutch games and whippings from weeping willow branches, from do as I say, not as I do, Children are to be seen and not heard. Bell bottoms and high waters, moon boots and zoot suits. I am from the era of racism, KKK, inequality and Jim Crow faced people all around me. I am from the days of government cheese, the Black Panthers movement and basement rent parties, the Pledge of Allegiance, Motown, and Southern comfort food. Remember that time when we all used to go outside and actually do something? I do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. Actually, you know what? Thank you, Michael Torres. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kennedy. Thank you, Minnesota Poet Laureate Gwen Westerman. Thank you, Zeke. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Alabama Poet Laureate, Ashley M. Jones. And thank you, Jamie. And I noticed uh, that we dropped the link for comments in the chat again. So if you get a chance to share feedback there, um, we wanna make sure you can do that. 
we know it's hard to multitask. I want to be present in the poems too. We'll keep that open for three days so that you get a chance to do it. I want to tell our students, there are 229 people attending tonight by Zoom. Um, we're so excited that you're here with us and thank you so much for being part of this special celebration. 10 years of MPWW, 10 years of student work, changing lives and community. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce a short film called Gravity Makes the Heart Go Heavy. It features a poem by David and it's the film that you're about to watch is made by a brilliant young filmmaker named Connor Epinette. Um, and if I understand this correctly, Connor also made the score that you'll hear uh, as part of the film tonight. So please enjoy Gravity Makes the Heart Go Heavy. Gravity makes the heart grow heavy. John Berryman threw his body off a Minneapolis bridge, a sack of sadness tumbling in icy air. I have been there myself. What I mean to say is, I have crossed that bridge. It's no golden gate, no monument of death calling to the sick at heart or merely weary. I have stood atop taller objects, glittering towers clad in copper glass, and parking garages grim with concrete cloaked in carbon smog and grit, and thought of falling, scaring passersby and pigeons, splayed on concrete sidewalk like a deconstructed man, a modern form, a sonnet that's lost its way. Hello, my name is Siobhan William Shem. I am an instructor with MPWW for three years and I'll be reading a poem on behalf of the amazing, wonderful, so talented, you know. It's called In a Pandemic. Sentences compared quarantine to prison while I was actually in prison. I collapsed with a virus to a yellow stained public bathroom floor. People sunk into their couches and gained pounds dubbed the pandemic 30. Society mental health, mental health crumbled like a dry month in. The stock market crashed, then soared, and poor people became poor in a pandemic. It was 26 hurricanes and a battalion of Greek storms. Under the storm surge, citizens flooded in the front of their seats of the automobiles. We came sick on the couch and celebrated Memorial Day in the streets. In a pandemic, George Floyd was murdered by Officer Derek Chauvin. Black Lives Matter took to the streets with race twists and anger. Wildfires scorched the West Coast, burned buildings and babies. Rioters stormed Minneapolis's third precinct, set ablaze and burned to a crisp. Good Samaritans gave food, water, and shelter to hurricane survivors. Firefighters died fighting wildfires. In a pandemic, my mother swung her cane to keep people six feet away from her in right aid. In a pandemic, civil unrest, peaceful protests, and rallies occurred without social distancing. Operation Warp Speed sped off while the opioid epi epidemic flourished. Assisted living homes became modern day tombs. Zoom became a community, then a society. Marchers marched 800 miles to the Washington Mall, again, this time in the pandemic. My niece fell into a deep depression and I didn't know how to help her. Hurricane Cristobal traveled northward to Minnesota. I wonder if that man who lives off the grid, off the grid with no internet access ever knew that we were in a pandemic. Las Vegas roulette wheels and slot machines stopped spinning while blackjack tables collected dust. Major league sports competed for trophies in empty, fanless arenas. Politicians played election day reindeer games. 
I gained a clear understanding of communal hypochondria when I read Claire Beam's The Illness Lesson in a pandemic. Movie theaters echoed crickets. The death toll wouldn't stop rising while the stock market wouldn't stop soaring. Tom Cruise spazzed out on his film crew for violating social distancing. People held deep discussions about social equality on the Zoom society. In a pandemic, writers had more time to write but suffered from writer's block. Couples binge watched, binge ate, and binge sex in a pandemic. I couldn't look away from Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B twerking in a pandemic. Monoliths kept appearing in obscure places in a pandemic. Some people had to run and hide from murder hornets in a pandemic. Medical professionals and food delivery persons became the most important people in a pandemic. I daydreamed until my daydreams became night dreams. In a pandemic, protesters in Portland pushed the police out and created a violent safe zone. Times Square emptied out and rats roamed freely. Another unarmed black man was murdered by the police in a pandemic. Protesters had never stopped protesting from the last cop killing in a pandemic. I worried about everyone's mental health, but nobody worried about mine. Domestic abuse and suicide skyrocketed while the stock market soared. Strip clubs went to Zoom society. Myron Burrell was released from prison. Republicans say Democrats stole the presidential election in a pandemic. People lost their loved ones but never had a funeral. Police shot another black man in the back in a pandemic. Militia showcased their firepower in a pandemic. I lost my appetite and my taste buds in a pandemic. All live concerts were canceled in a pandemic. Young black rappers kept getting killed in a pandemic. What the hell? Black Panther died from cancer in a pandemic. Fortune 500 finally implemented social equality in a pandemic. In solidarity, police locked arms with protesters and marched the same streets they patrol in a pandemic. Some idiots in my home state plotted to kidnap the governor in a pandemic. People of all races and nationalities converged on Capitol Hill, accosted by droves of law enforcement in a pandemic. Trump supporters, vanilla ISIS, converged on Capitol Hill hunted Nancy Pelosi and trashed the building with very little law enforcement present in a pandemic. Pollution over major cities dissipated in a pandemic. Literally, the world spun one second faster in a pandemic. We lost Cicely Tyson, Hammer and Hake Aaron, John Lewis, and the notorious RBG in a pandemic. My four-year-old niece, Patri Chris my four-year-old niece, Christina, adorably sang, we gotta kill that coronavirus in a pandemic. My name is Bill Breen and um, I'm a writing instructor with MPWW. Uh, very fortunate to say that I've been with it from almost the beginning and I'm uh, especially honored to be part of tonight's event. Uh, I'm going to read a poem by Fong, and Fong is not only a phenomenal writer, he's also an outstanding visual artist, and it's Fong's artwork that is on the cover for tonight's event. Uh, this is a poem called What I Have Been Doing. What I have been doing. Not a vast ocean. Not a deep lake. I crawl the cracked asphalt of Minnesota Penitentiary, still water, collecting salt water, fold it, tuck it inside an envelope, mail it to a world that does not write me back. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you, Fong. Thank you, Bino. Thank you, Siobhan, for that beautiful reading. Thank you, Connor, for the film, for the score. And thank you, for the David, for the poem that gave inspiration to it. 
Um, I want to take a moment just to recognize all the people behind the scenes making tonight's event run so smoothly. No pressure, no pressure. Um, but the videos, the items in the chat, um, we've got a team of people who are making all that happen. And so thank you, Mike Alberti. Thank you, Su Um, I can just tell you guys behind the scenes, a tremendous amount of preparation preparation goes into making tonight possible. The run of show, the scripts, the links, the videos, the tests, the pre-calls. Um really I just represents the kind of care and dedication. Uh, that people like Mike and Sue put into everything they do. So thank you so much for those contributions and for making tonight uh, run so well. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a video that was made by one of our community members. I've mentioned Ryan Stapera a couple of times and I just want to thank him again for all the work he's done to add uh, video to tonight's celebration. One of the advantages of meeting online is it allows us to do some of these things more easily than we might if we were meeting in person. And we got a whole year to figure out how we're going to do it next year. And we're going to do it next year. But I'm, we're really appreciative of people like Ryan, of the time and care that he put into putting to this next video together. And it's an interview with some of our students. Uh, it was shot at Powderhorn Park. I know I was there. I got a Danish and shared some conversation and fellowship. It was a great day. Really hope you enjoyed this video. MPWW, the writing community on the inside, they meant everything. They was like my brothers then, my brothers now. We had this like subculture. Inside of that culture, we had a subculture, a place that we called like our own community. And for a lot of us, it was shifting the way in which we seen community. It, it transcended color lines, it transcended how much time you had. There were people who had short time. There were people who would never go home. Like to sit in a writing circle with someone who's never going home and to see them write about light and inspiration and beauty, I would be leaving saying, well, hell, if they still got some beauty, I got to find some somewhere. The community, we, we have to have that support without that support fellow writers and then which extends also to instructors and mentors through PWW. Without that, you don't really have that energy. The importance of writing for me, um, it's a lifeline. Um, it was a way for me to um, sort of escape um, and process everything that I went through um, while in prison, but things that I wasn't able to process, you know, as a kid. Um, things that, you know, I saw other people endure as a kid and growing up. So prison was, it, it, it kept, um, it, it kept me confined um, physically, but writing allowed me to escape those, those boundaries. Writing means a lot of different things to me, especially in prison. It's about documenting what's going on around me, all the stories that are around me, a lot of documenting the pain and the loss that's around me. That's a big part of it. I journal every day because I don't want to feel like everything runs together. Time can be very plastic, I think anywhere, but especially here where it seems like, you know, weeks are short, but days are long. And it's just important to acknowledge, I think, what happened during that day and what changes are made. When I found myself incarcerated, writing was a necessity for sanity. And at that point, early on, before MPWW came into the picture, th there was no formal anything. It was just kind of lethargic, you know, writing. And then Writer's Workshop and MPWW came in, and that's where I got a foundation of writing and was able to start looking at it as a craft and then start accepting that I myself were a writer. So when I was inside, it, it was such a daily practice for me, not for assignments or for anything on the outside, but just so I could maintain my own identity in a place that um, was not pro-identity, I guess. Us in prison, we need to find things to consume a lot of the time. 
that we have. And obviously, we have time on our hands. So writing is a way to fill up the void of emptiness of time. And it's also a way to find means to create something out of ourselves, to actually take our thoughts and what we believe or our dreams and write it into paper and make it something tangible. What's nice about creative writing or what's really beneficial about creative writing is that you do get a chance to explore maybe parts of your inner self, your imagination, your thoughtfulness about the world in a way you were never given permission to do before you got incarcerated. And now you have permission. Now you can do, it's all you because nobody can ever control what you think, your imagination, that can't happen. I recall when I first came to prison 23 years ago that they give you this little stubby pencil about the size of a pinky finger. And they give you about 20 sheets of paper. And I'm, I'm guessing that most people write a letter to someone that they know, which makes sense to tell people about this new uh, way of life that they have to experience, unfortunately. And I remember writing some letters, but I also remember writing raps with that stubby little pencil and that paper. And that's the one thing about being in prison is that you can take my paint, you can take the paint brushes, you can lock me in a dark room, but at some point you will have to provide me with a writing utensil and some paper. And at that moment, I can document whatever I'm thinking. And that's why writing is, I think, more well suited for people in prison. If an institution's goal is to help the individual get out and be a better productive person, then I believe that a program like a creative writing program can do that. And it's and, and it, it doesn't take a lot of time or a lot of resources. It could be prison run, it could be inmate run. It was a huge part of the things that I seen continue to help shift and change people's perception on how they, how they seen themselves, how they seen their connection to community and their role in community through writing. So it meant a lot, it meant everything. It's like a transcender. Writing is useful because it transcends mm -hmm. prison and in prison, you kind of have this feeling that you're never going to see this again. It becomes this alternate reality that you like slightly remember, but it's not real to you. So inside a prison, folks having a chance to write actually keeps them connected to the human family. It keeps them connected to their own feelings, to the, the, the importance of processing their feelings and being able to take snapshots of, of memories that they had, both good and bad, and make sense of them, some of that trauma to be able to like highlight them and to look at them now and to make sense of them. I believe truly in the empowerment of the individuals in these places, and part of empowering them is by strengthening aspects of their lives that make them more capable. And one of those things is in the development of language. And the development of language, increasing a human being's language, increases their access to power, increases their access to you know, all the other things in lives. To, and I think that is a really critical element in what we do with these programs. And what we've done on our own is the, is the sense that I do this in order to make myself more capable and to empower myself and the others that come after me. What a powerful video. I really resonate with that moment at the end where Zeke says what we do with these programs, what we do on our own. Um, and MPWW really belongs to our students. Uh, we facilitate the programming, but what the programming does, what the programming is, um, the writing collectives that have been formed, the reading series that have been started, that's the work of our students. That's their work creating community within facilities and outside of facilities. Their work has touched so many people, so many organizations, has been 
uh, printed and anthologized in so many places. And that's their efforts, their art that's making all those things happen. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Antonio. And um, he's going to read some of his own work. Thanks, MKD, my friend. Um, happy 10th birthday um, to the family, you know. Um, this is family for me. Um, grew up in foster homes, foster care, and all of that type of stuff. And, you know, I have many different family members, parents, and yeah, MPWW is another one of my family, you know. So um, I'm reading two pieces um, that uh, MKD actually helped me with the uh, intros to, so, or the uh, titles. So let me know what you think later. The first one is Searching for My Origins. The sun's glare raises questions that my soul ponders. Blades of grass offer answers in the earthy scent. The wind reveals secrets as it caresses my skin. I find myself in the ancient knots and scarred bark of a birch tree, white and black and twisted. Second one, reincarnated within stained layers. A broken filament inside a cloudy bulb, coated in dust. Like it, I must suffer in silence. Light switch flipped won't expose the stench stained tile walls box in as the grime ever present complains. Mirrored muck mires reflections, distorted images obscure as worth, a steam smeared in layers over years. Time has no meaning. Lost in the nostalgia of disinfectants twanged, it links me to civilization. A haven where curtains pulled closed don't hide a filthy lake pooled around the drain, but contains errant droplets that give birth to freshness. There's hope in 150 watts, pride in a bottle of bleach, character in exhausted rags, life in the hands of people. Just want to shout out to um, all of MPWW and instructors and uh, mentors, but specifically those who I had the pleasure of working with directly. Um, Jen, all day, love you to death. Mary Stein, love you to death. MKD, love you to death. Elizabeth Tannen, love you to death. Dr. Naka, love you to death. I learned so much in every one of those classes. I grew in every one of those classes. I created pieces that people are like, they, they love, <laughs> you know, from every one of those classes. Um, and my brothers who I, who I, you know, took the classes with, Chris Cabrera, Sho, Tate, Andrew Croche, Omar Aziz, Corvang, and Red, um, you know, and, who's actually about to have a piece read, who I was actually in the class when this piece was, you know, shared. So um, I'll pass it to Ari for read. Thank you, Antonio, that was beautiful. Um, I'm gonna have that tree image stuck in my head, black, white, and twisted off. It's, that's there, <laughs> that's not going anywhere. Um, yeah, I'm so honored uh, and it's wonderful to hear Antonio that you you're familiar with this piece, so that's great. <laughs> Maybe it's a testing to write again. The words don't go void out here. Um, so I'm really honored to read Red's work tonight. Um, it's brilliant and to the bone. Um, it's a type of love story to a friend. Uh, and if it, it's one that if I were in the audience, um, it would hook me in the gut, <laughs> um, uh, like it did to my husband today when I was practicing it. So um, I hope you know that, uh, Red. Um, and, and then just a little bit, uh, Jen asked me to introduce myself a little. So um, so this happens often, this hook in the gut from students' work, um, because I get to be behind the scenes as the new mentor coordinator, but also um, before that in the following, the previous years of being the broadside editor. Um, and that was just such a, it, it continues to be um, an amazing moment where I get all of these pieces sent to me uh, and I get to just read them and sit back and 
again, get kind of hooked in over and over again um, and have my own kind of quiet moments with them. Uh, so I hope if anything, that's in the testament uh, to words and the ways that um, students, I hope you know your words don't go out and <laughs> into the void, they continue on. Um, and yeah, so many lines I have memorized <laughs> or stuck in my head like Antonio's piece here. So um, I'm ever grateful to be part of it and I get to get, get to read Red's work, which has some big honking words in it. So I hope I don't screw it up for you, Red, but I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> All right. Um, this is, there are no bars in Rush City, and it's an excerpt I read. Scott was over six foot, with muscles like braided bridge cable under his tattooed hide. I remember being in the cell with him, kicked back on our bunks, staring at our 13-inch television, watching some nature program where a giant constrictor put the squeeze on some poor, pitiable prey. Breathtaking. This beautiful horror an apex predator. Nature does nothing in vain, or so it would seem. Before Scott relinquished to being the best at handball, before his legs would occasionally betray him when he ran stairs, before he had to strap his hands to the pull-up bar while I pretended not to notice, before he shook out his hands like they were frozen or on fire, before Scott signed up to see the physical therapist because it was just some tendonitis, Red before he alarmed the PT enough to order more tests, before Scott or I ever heard the medico invoke the possibility of global nerve damage. Scott and I would work on our art pieces until shift change. The guard on second watch would clock out and the third watch would clock in. During this time, we would take a break and have coffee and snacks. Many times it would be vanilla wafers or store-bought pastry a mega honey bun or a bear claw. But sometimes if occasion called for it, it would be Scott's Bailey bars. He'd make them in his exclusive Bailey bowl, one he brought with him from out West. His special bowl was the size of one of those 40, 450 page best-selling hardcover books. A regular Tupperware deal with a foggy bottom and a crisp denim blue lid, which Scott had carved his name and inmate number into. The bowl was one of his prized possessions. Scott had done some hard time in harder places. His Tupperware may have been warped, but it still kept its seal. Before Scott signed up for health services, before they tested his blood and urine, before they put a scope up his ass and looked inside a shit chute, before they took a muscle biopsy, a small chunk of Bailey out of his calf and sent it off to the lab where the report came back suggesting a neurological problem. Before Scott sat in a, sp a special seat, an electric chair read, where they zapped him with electrical current and studied his neurological responses and noticed his times were slow read. Before all his diagnosis, before prognosis horseshit, the Bailey, bar, the Bailey bars were alchemical mixture of peanut butter, honey, dry oatmeal, and crushed graham crackers. The bottom crust was kneaded, tamped, and perfectly massaged into a one and a half inch foundation. The middle layer, a grout of burnished liquid bronze, hand whipped caramel rendered to a just right, gooey Goldilocks consistency. The top layer, a bowl of M&Ms, real ones, cradled, slow heated and intermittently drizzled with a splish and then a splash of milk, stirred over low heat in order to make the chocolate agreeably shake hands with the caramel. This chocolatey final layer that Coupe de Ville, once cooled, would settle into a firm yet soft fudge-like frosting, cool and cush as mocha-colored Cadillac seats before he kept dropping his toothbrush in the toilet, before it was the same for his mustache comb, before Scott took an extra 10 minutes shaving his head in the shower, only to have more battle damage on his dome than if he tussled with a tomcat, before plastic forks, spoons, and knives were shattered frustrations, before ink pens and brushes were sent screaming from the art table, before turning pages broke book bindings, before health services 
finally gave him a roll of Coban to write, wrap all his utensils in. Scott would invest a lot of time and care in making these Bailey bars just so. The process couldn't be rushed. The contents mixed and mingled artfully, deftly, handcrafted, intuitively, applying the right amount of heat and pressure and time to sculpt his bars. He would then sequester his creation under the bottom bunk, cloistered among our gray property bins. He would give it time, time to meditate and achieve enlightenment, or at least time to cool to room temperature. Scott would occasionally stop his pen work, sneak a peek, pop the lid on the Bailey bowl, test and probe the convivial contents with a connoisseur's finger. The aroma of baked goods, a vestige of home permeating our cell. He would then put the lid back on and say, almost ready, Red. You can't rush Bailey bars, Red. It takes a long time. It takes as long as it takes before we give. More agonizing minutes would pass. Scott would put down his big pen or brush and pop the bowl lid again to test and probe, tease his bars with contented fingers. The blue bowl lid may go back on. The process may repeat, lid up, lid down, a few more pernicious sounds. Inevitably, the torture turns and the savory ballet ends with Scott speaking the words, Bailey bars are ready, red. Grab the bar, take a taste, smile and say, mm, Big Scott, best bar ever. You didn't have to say thank you. His giving you a piece of his bar was his way of saying you're cool with him, that you were in his car, the car that could only hold six people at a time. And sometimes that was more than he was even comfortable with. If he deemed you unworthy for whatever reason, he wouldn't pull over and politely drop you off somewhere. Instead, he'd kick you out like he was running shine after dark, hightailing it, boot to the floorboards, lights out with the trunk full of hooch, mason jars clattering together like ghost chimes. Before they made Scott a reverend, before the Department of Corrections banished him, before Minnesota, Wyoming, and Iowa juggled Scott's afflicted and expensive, not quite fatal, fast enough carcass. Before Scott was viewed as a plague of medical bills and extra staff scheduling in order to shuttle him from one cut, hor cut rate horse doctor to another. Before the bean counters stepped in and collectively wished for corrections version of terminal velocity, where Scott would crash into the earth and spare them all the headache and high cost and just die already. Before they would dream of paroling him. Before they would ask him to debrief. Before he told them to pound sand and that they can kill me, but they can't eat me red. Stop gopping at the bar or I'll kither you in the glop. Quit holding it in your clumsy mitts. It'll start to melt, you daft bastard. What's it gonna be? The bar or the pavement? Be quick or be dead? All this running through your head while he might float like a phantom, a phantom with a plastic knife pointed at your throat, waiting for you to bite down on the spectral hunk of Bailey bar. Best bars ever, right, Red? These, uh, there are days that ask and years that answer, Scott. I remember when Scott gave voice to his oblivion. It was during shift change and therefore coffee and snack time. I remember breaking open a bag of pink frosted animal cookies. We were lucky to get them. They were on special from the prison commissary for a limited time only. I can't recall if Scott brought the cookies or I did. I do remember spilling them out onto his blue bowl lid. The cookies were coated on top in bubblegum pink frost, camels and elephants, monkey, monkeys and bears, giraffes and hippos, but no sharks. Scott related to me like he was reading from a teleprompter. He told me he had ALS and that he was a dead man walking. He delivered the grim news and I provided the weather. I sat there and sipped my insipid coffee and looked at Scott's blurry bowl lid with three ring circus worth of animals in miniature. I noticed some of the animal cookies were missing their legs and tails and trunks and heads. Like in an electable circus, you come from nothing and you leave from nothing. All right, thank you so much. 
That's a beautiful reading. Red, those words are vivid and detailed and um, so layered with images. And I felt present with you in so many of those moments. Thank you for that. And Antonio, my brother, I have so much love for your poetry and so much love for you. Thank you for being here tonight and for sharing the gift of your work in your presence with us. You know, our, our students' work reaches people in a variety of ways. A lot of times it's creative writing, big up creative writing, um, but sometimes it's things like journalism. And I'm really excited to tell you about, well, actually, I'm gonna ask my friend Aaron to tell you about a way that our students' work, our students' journalistic work is gonna, maybe find its way to you in an unexpected place. Erin? Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm Erin Sharkey, uh, nice to see everyone. I'm an instructor with MPWW, um, but I also wear another hat. Um, I am a film producer on the side, um, and I just finished producing the sixth season of a program called The Small Business Revolution, which this season shot um, in Minneapolis and St. Paul and focused on black owned businesses. Um, and I'm really proud of it. Um, one of the businesses that we got to feature um, is the Minnesota Spokesman Reporter, which is one of the um, longest running black uh, newspapers in the country um, and the, one of the oldest black owned businesses in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And each of the businesses were able to um, pay it forward to another group. And um, Minnesota Spokesman Reporter uh, picked the prison mirror and I was able to get clearance to bring a film crew in and to um, interview and spend some time with Jeff and Fresh and the folks um, at Stillwater. And um, so I'd invite you all to check it out. Um, it will premiere on November 9th on Hulu and Amazon Prime. And you can also watch it on smallbusinessrevolution.org. Um, and just check out the episode with um, Minnesota Spokesman Recorder and you'll see, I think some, some faces you know. Um, and yeah, I hope that you find it moving. It was, it was a really fun project to be a part of. And I was so glad for the intersection of that project and my, my deep love of um, Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. So thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. I'm so excited to see that um, on Hulu, Amazon Prime, and on smallbusinessrevolution.org. All right. So make sure to check that out and watch all the episodes Aaron produced, but make sure to see the episode featuring um, Jeff and Fresh. Uh, I'm going to introduce just very quickly this next video, which also features Jeff's work. Um, it's, uh, it's audio, actually, in his poem, Golden Grants. This is Jeff, and this is an excerpt from The Black Cloud over classical music, Golden Grants, and My Curiosity. A couple months into the school year, a new girl joined my second grade class. Keisha wore glasses, had a jerry curl, and brown skin the shade of toasted wheat bread. Miss Smith, without assessing Keisha, put her in my reading group. Keisha read as well as I did and expressed as much impatience as I did at the slower readers. She would fidget and huff and puff when other kids in the group struggled over the words. A light bulb went off in my seven-year-old mind. My class of about 20 children had four African-Americans, including Keisha and myself. All of us were in the same reading group. All four of us were assigned to the same desk. What really began to infuriate me was my realization about what this meant for breakfast. Every morning, the teacher called tables of students to retrieve their food. If you were one of the first three tables called, you might possibly get Golden Graham theory or a kick. I don't recall ever getting any Golden Graham. When I realized that my skin color kept me in a low reading group and from receiving golden grams for breakfast, my enthusiasm for reading in school diminished. Thank you, Jeff. That was powerful and amazing. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Janata. And Janata, I think you're going to read a poem by Glitter Squirrel. 
You are absolutely right. Um, wow, I just have been just so moved and waterfall and genius and just, I don't know, just the magnificence of these words tonight. Like it's always so healing to be at readings with MPWW and um, yeah, I feel very excited also to be sharing the work of Glitter Squirrel who I got to work with when I taught a dramatic um, writing class um, at Shakopee. And um, yeah, I find this piece so amazing and I'm excited to share it with all of y'all today. Um, the piece is called Raking by Glitter Squirrel. In a pile of leaves wearing mocha mustaches, we sit in all brown gardens, loosely woven, no mittens. Silent space is static stillness, but for obese squirrels scurrying with last minute to-do lists, expecting any second drizzle. A cardinal does a drive by past us like a red M&M in an ashen sky. He's got a mouth on him. I yell, get a blog. He gives me the finger as he is in flight. Cardinals are rude like that. I look down at my cold right palm. The upper line in the middle breaks forewarning of desolation in the middle of my life. I am in the middle of my life. I tuck my hands in your blue pockets, looking up just in time to see nothing. Thank you. Y'all hear my kid? Sorry. All right, y'all did say, oh, include the babies, da, 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 until a baby kid pulls up. No. thank you. Up. Thank you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I know. All of it's beautiful. And I just want to say something about that Golden Grams piece. I totally had that experience in school. And it's so interesting. Like, I don't know, just certain pieces just hit you. And you're like, yeah, just those certain microaggressions, like from childhood that you kind of live, but you don't even think like you can even feel no type of ways about. So anyways, love you all. I could say something magical about every piece. Love you all. And now it's my pleasure to introduce David Lawrence Grant, who's going to read one of B's poems called Toll. Yeah, B was, our beloved poet B was thinking about his father uh, when he wrote this and uh, made me think about mine. Uh, so I, I, I hope I can bring the right energy to it. Toll, I cherished most. Those hours spent knee to chest next to your bass drum. You lost in the rise and fall of rhythms. You'd been mastering since the pots and pans you pounded as a child. Me and my slight body thumping pleasure with the sounds you made. As much as you love those moments behind your drums, fevered like a crashed cymbal, I loved you just as much, and now I'm rhythmless and awkward, in prison, a hollowed husk and muffled pulse. You must have felt this, an abrupt offbeat when the call came, reporting your firstborn was arrested for a serious crime two states away. I've imagined your reaction. Furrowed brow, mute, what? pursing the lips, long fingers constricting the phone as a stone mallet quaked your guts. But I'm not a father. I can't pretend to wear the skin of one. Whatever dread possessed your bones, I can't claim to know. Echoes are there though. Low undertones I sense quivering your pen when you sign love dad at the end of rare letters. Somewhere I read that handwriting reflects the writer. Their mood mirrored in every slant, loop and space between words. But you're not a longhand man. All but love dad is tight and I don't blame you. Maybe you fear your hand's betrayal of what throbs on the inside, unable to keep stoic with smooth cursive. 
I get it. The convexity of sentiment and need to restrain. I am my father's son. We don't have to speak for me to know the mad chorus coursing through you. I listen between heartbeats, thump, your agony, thump, guilt, thump, shame, thump, those burdens parents possess, like the toll of a church bell makes, and I've wrenched that rope until my palms singe. Thank you, B. Uh, David, thank you for that. And you did bring the energy to it. Um, I had so much love for B's work, for Glitter Girl's work, and um, just include them among many writers in our program who are just making work that uh, is crafted with tremendous skill. Um, I miss both of you. I miss all of our students. I miss all of you. And uh, thank you for allowing us to share your work tonight. Um, I want, just want to also thank Janata and Aaron and Jeff and Fresh for being part of tonight's program as well. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce a short film by Louise, who could not be here with us tonight, but is with us in spirit and it with us it with her art. And this film was also made by Connor Epinet. Thanks so much. A woman gray within shadows, losing my sense of normalcy through the monotony that freezes my already cold spine. My hands never warm. Am I not created for warm? The crude cement cell block erases the moon. My dreams sense no guidance, my tears no destination, my scars still wound. When will my ancestral guide return? I carved my sternum, carved the holiness out, ceasing my breath, the genesis of my fear. I am not home. Where is my Bamaji? I'm a foreigner in my own land, a ghostless shadow begging to be remembered for more in solitude. Where are my well-worn moccasins to guide me home? Who will carry this desolation when the McGeezy wings are too dirty from thundering storms? Savior, I am within my kaleidoscope breaking and failing my heartbeat again. Me mama, I miss your home. Lingozi, I still smell your morning breath. Abba, I am I. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Moritz and I'm just um, thrilled to be um, reading a poem tonight by um, SW. It's called No Trace. Um, thank you, Connor, and thank you, Louise, for that beautiful poem. And the film is just so stunning. I'm still, still absorbing it, so I'll take a minute. So this is No Trace. <laughs> Loud echoes off barren walls. We all know those square tile patterns, ice cold. An Arctic front flooded through, a child sits isolated and empty as an unanswered door, staring puzzled at the womb formed in the window. Pain from a caliber the night before nothing fills these vacant cabinets, traces of a blind man's path, a 
microwave and worm-like items simmering in a bowl to fill a knotted stomach, fighting against itself because nothing fills these empty shelves so void. Dust particles dance in the projection of the sun, setting in like snow sucked in by observant kitchen cabinets, not a spoon, a knife, a pot or pan completely wiped out, a bomb has taken place. In this room of no trace, only five years of age, crying out like a child, ripping from a womb, mom, mom. The only reply is multiple reflections of a similar voice. My first kitchen is my first encounter with emptiness. Hi, I'm Emily, and this is from Zeke. Years back, I wrote an introduction for one of the first of these readings, and I said that there was a natural relationship between writers and the incarcerated because time is an emergency. And both writers and people who spend their lives in a cage understand this. Back then, the program hadn't grown up to be what it has become, but the emergencies, the deadlines, they were the same then as they are now. We are communities waiting for everything, waiting for mail, for meals, wait to be forgiven, wait to be redeemed like a coupon loaded with exemptions and conditions, wait for Jesus to return, for parents to come back to life, for the Superman of institutions to fix our facilities or to better our schools, wait to be empowered. What kind of trick bag thinking is that? We sit around waiting on a relationship, friends to show back up, wait for kids to be born, grow old enough to see us outside the narrowest lens, wait for the next summer and the next one after that. We wait for appeals, doors to open, laws to change, society to change, someone to see or to feel what we've experienced. Wait for cells do cell doors to shut, the noise to dull. Time in the life of a writer, a writer or a prisoner is an emergency. Incarcerated writing communities provide for us what we can only assume they offer to non-incarcerated writing communities. Peer support, friendship, competition, rivalry, shared stakes in the success of its members. These communities offer reminders of time and the emergencies time represents. Classes get canceled and cut unexpectedly. In 2005, whole education departments were shut down for months and every computer in the joint was wiped and scoured, including all of our stored work. There are lockdowns, seizures of materials, intentionally, sometimes collaterally. There are surprise transfers that leave us without computer access again and again, and we must figure out individually and collectively how to keep the things we need most. We who are working hard to mend some of the wounds in the social, cultural, and familial fabric of our lives live with a stopwatch to create our work as the evidence that will show something redemptive within us. I published my first, first memoir after 17 years in prison with the support of my small but unified family unit. Less than a year later, my mom passed away. She was my last living blood relative. Deadlines, story and book completions fulfill the need to have whole complete pieces of writing to speak for the incomplete aspects of our lives and families. They are our main emergency. The incarcerated writer is chasing and being chased all at once. Because a gavel bangs and instantly you are chasing a fleeting version of yourself and being chased by the minutes you have left on this earth. And that is constant and it is exhausting. So we write with an urgency, with some fear that might also be courage depending on all the variables of our time on earth. We write without knowing if our failing bodies and minds will complete what it is trying to say. If those stingy distributors of redemption will ever see what we were trying to show them. There's a natural clock inside of people who have been counted. We share the urgency with all peoples who've ever been counted as part of an inventory or crushed to death under the force of a knee or the falling seconds of a precise and brutal history. In a writer's world, there are bills that have to be paid, 
both literally and artistically. As a community of individuals wearing the marks of these experiences, we have paid our debts in time, even as incarcerators continue to spend it against our bodies and our families. They are our own emergencies, the ones we've created and those the universe has prepared for us. Years after having written one of the first introductions for this reading, I'm finally coming home. But time is still an emergency because the bid is long and the lifetime is short. We're excited for you to come home, Zeke. <laughs> And now uh, to close us out is Vaughn. Thank you so much, Vaughn. Thank you so much, Emily, um, for your beautiful Michael, you're muted. Michael, you're muted. Thanks, Sue. Oh, I almost made it. Almost had a clean run. I wanted to say thank you, Vaughn, for your words. Uh, they mean so much. Thank you, Emily, for your reading of Zeke's words. And Zeke, thank you for your words. I can't wait to see you. And thank you all for being here and for being part of tonight's celebration. Tonight, when we celebrate our students and 10 years of the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. This next part is also super important. It's a super important part of tonight's celebration. This is the part where we hold up signs and show our students that we are thinking of them, that we love them, and that we wish them all good things. One special request, please hold up your sign for a little while. We're gonna take everyone off mute, um, share words of encouragement, clap, make a joyful noise. And if you have a sign, hold it up for a little while so that our students can see them. Thanks again for being here tonight. Thank you so much for being part of this community. We love you, we need you, and we're grateful for you. See you all next year. Okay. okay. Fabulous. It meant so much to hear these words. Thank you so much. Thank you, students. Y'all already know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for hearing me. Love you, Michelle. Love you, Love you, Michelle. You can hear me. Love you, John. Emily. Love you, Michelle. 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 Love you,
Yes. Good night. Thank you, Gwen and Ashley. Thank you, Kevin and Antonio. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Paul. That was a beautiful. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Paul. This program is amazing. It needs to keep happening and bigger and better. Thank you so much, Michael. You're great, Michael. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, students. Bye, Zeke. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much. If you hear and I don't know, you like dope. If you hear and I don't know, message to you. Love to all the people that I know. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye, y'all. Love you. Love you, Kev. Thank you, what Kevin. Amazing reading. That was spiritual. <laughs> All right, let's go. Oh my God, what is this? Who is Zeke, man? Bye. Bye, everybody. Wow. Good night. Thank Kisses. you. Happy Halloween. Bye. Happy birthday, Bye. PWW. Happy Halloween. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Happy Halloween, Yay. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much. I don't everybody. know you. Buy my book, too. Buy it. Yeah, buy Kevin's book. Buy <laughs> book. Right Kevin's book. Buy your book right now. I'm dropping Kevin's book in the link. Yes, Shout out to 10 years the MPW. Yes. Oh. Feedback. I'm glad we stay with that same art for Fong every year. I, I'm glad that we stay with that. Right? That's amazing. That's just legendary. Thank you, everybody. Get some y'all. Oh, wait, one more time. Let's talk. The stars are You're all beautiful. Thank Everyone you so likes y'all candles for a hundred years of writing. Yes, yes. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>